hard act to follow, Professor Sample, but I think you're up to it. I, will, I just want to start by saying that the, the proudest moments of my professional life basically all relate to this individual to my right, and I think we all in this room owe him an extra and individualized thank you. Judicial selection debates often devolve into an exclusively binary discussion pitting elections versus appointment systems at the expense of incremental and more achievable reforms. The fact is that only very rarely, and then, even then, only after decades of sustained efforts, do states change their fundamental modes of judicial selection. How rarely? It's been more than 20 years since any state moved from judicial elections to merit selection. Confronting that fact means acknowledging two others. Elective systems must be improved. Appointive systems must be improved. If we focus on those incremental challenges, then it's fruitful to also have the parallel elections versus appointments discussion. If we truly care about court reform, we must adopt a triage mentality. The rule of law needs a tourniquet. It is also a very good idea to consider hypothetical far-off surgery focusing on appointments. But focusing only on appointments is a disservice to litigants who don't have another 20 years to wait. There are some who look at judicial elections and see only one amendment, the first. But make no mistake, statistically, that is verifiably a fringe position. Indeed, wherever one is on campaign regulation in the constituent branches, a topic on which reasonable people disagree, when it comes to our courts, focusing only on the First Amendment ignores and minimizes an equally important constitutional interest, due process. Even in a time in which we are seemingly now hardwired in this country to see every issue in terms of left and right, there are still certain American values that do transcend our partisan divisions. To put that differently, at least when it comes to the courts, concern over the influence of green is not and should not be a matter of red versus blue. Since monetary influence can't be proven in individual instances, we either address the concern systemically or not at all. Is the need for triage real or is it just rhetoric? Well, ask yourself whether you think it might be reasonable, the, the general standard for disqualification, to question the judge's impartiality where a Los Angeles Times investigation of Nevada trial court judges revealed that even judges running unopposed collected hundreds of thousands of dollars from litigants appearing in their courtrooms. And the report noted that the donations were, quote, frequently dated within days of when the judge took action in the contributor's case. Might it be reasonable? Justice O'Connor mentioned the Illinois race in 2004. Feel free to take a glance at page 57 of the report in front of you, which has a timeline involved in that race. And realize that the $456 million claim against the judge's biggest contributor had been pending before the Illinois High Court for 17 months, i.e. for the duration of the campaign. Coincidence? Maybe. Causation? Probably not. But the optics? Not good. And of course, there's the West Virginia scenario about which we're all familiar and to which we all owe an incredible debt of gratitude. But the broad support for Mr. Caperton and the Harmon Mining Company reflects the big tent that is uniquely available to us in the courts context in a way that it's not on other issues. It's an opportunity to work together in the center towards small and big reforms alike. Indeed, after working with Hughes, Pennsylvania attorneys long before anyone thought that a cert petition to the U.S. Supreme Court would ever go anywhere. I'll never forget that Ted, when Ted Olson joined the case, I walked up and down the halls of the Brennan Center pumping my fists in pure exhilaration. Now I can tell you, I can assure you, that 
In cases that don't involve court reform, ecstasy at the thought that Ted is joining a case is not something you see every day at the Brennan Center. And likewise, if Ted could be here today, though he had a prior obligation, he'd tell you that he had the same exact experience and was questioned by many of his conservative colleagues who were deeply suspicious of him working with us. Ultimately, it proved to be one of the most productive, fruitful, and friendly relationships ever. And the point is that that kind of strange bedfellows coalition, coalition is uniquely available in the court's context. Indeed, Charlie Kolb and, and Mike Petro of CED were instrumental, as was Merrill Chertoff of Georgetown, who works closely with Justice O'Connor, in generating support for the case from companies like Lockheed Martin, Pepsi, Intel, and Walmart. And it's no accident that a living legend who is one of the greatest jurisprudential centrists in our nation's history has practically made this cause her raison d'etre. The recent surge of progress is the product of a perfect storm of extraordinary contributions by extraordinary people, three of whom are in the room today. Hugh Caperton, Burt Brandenburg, and Justice O'Connor. And to that list, I would add John Grisham and Ted Olson, all of whom have made their contributions in, temporally in the very recent years. And this is a moment where we have the opportunity to seize and build a strong coalition.